Hey, welcome back to your favorite Rust tutorial series on YouTube. My name is Max, I'm the Comfy Coder, and today we're going to take a look at variables, mutability, and data types. So, to get started, as always, what we are going to do is we're going to create a new project with Cargo New, and this time I'm going to call this one variables. Just cd into that directory, start VS Code, and we're already off to a good start. As always, we start out with a bare bones Hello World project. However, this time let's just get rid of that because we already had that last time. And let's generate a variable. So in order to declare a variable, you'd use the keyword let. And after that, let's say we just name it x, so this is going to be the name. We have the colon, and after the colon we have the type annotation, meaning we tell the compiler what type this variable is going to be. So in this case I want to have a 32-bit integer, so i32, and now optionally we can assign a value to it, let's say 10. So this is already all you need to define a variable. However, the compiler is not really happy with us. It tells us that we have an unused variable, x. And in order to get around that, we will just print this variable, x equals, and then we'll do some braces, some empty braces here. And those empty braces will be filled with the statement after the comma, which is going to be x. And now just run the whole thing with cargo run, and we'll see x equals 10. Perfect. So now say we want to know what double of x is. So we'll just do x equals x times 2. And we want to print that again. I'll just borrow this statement from up here. And we'll run that. Oh, and we get a compiler error. So what happened here? Well, Rust found out that we have a first assignment to x in line number 2, which is correct. And it keeps us from assigning again to this variable in line number 4, as we cannot assign twice to an immutable variable. That means that defining your variable just with let automatically gives you an immutable variable. So immutability, or constness, is an opt-out feature in Rust. You have to opt out of constness in order to get a mutable variable. Just the opposite is true when you look at languages like C and C++, where const is an opt-in feature. So you opt into constness, you write const and then your variable. So how do we get around this? We use the keyword mute, and now we have a mutable variable x, and you see the error message goes away. We can run our code and everything is fine. Having this constness by default is a really nice thing because you intentionally have to tell the compiler, hey, I want to mutate that variable somewhere later on. And otherwise, all your variables are const and you cannot, by accident, override them. So Rust does have the concept of a const variable, however, or it has the const keyword. However, this is really used for things that would be a constant in real life as well. So for example, if you say you want to convert from kilometers to meters, and you always need to multiply by a factor of 1000. So km to m, which might be an i32 as well, is equal to 1000. So this is a typical use of a const keyword in Rust. It has some compile time advantages, which I will not be going into now, just so we have seen the keyword, there is const. And of course, we still need to use it now. So we'll just say placeholder kilometers is equals to placeholder meter. And in this case, we're going to insert x first. And then the second time, we're going to do x times km to m. And we'll run this. And of course, you see 20 kilometers are 20,000 meters, as expected. Now that you know about mutability, let us check out data types a bit more. So I've used this i32 without telling you much about it. So it's a 32-bit integer, 
the same thing you would by default have in C++ if you just type int. But of course, there is a lot more. And those data types are all built into the language, which is really nice. So for example, instead of an i32, we could have an i8, which is an 8-bit integer. We could have 16-bit, you could have 32 bits, 64, 128, and you could also have i size, where size will automatically default to your architecture. So if you're on a 64-bit system, i size will be equal to an i64. Additionally, you have all of those values with unsigned. So you have an unsigned 8-bit, 16-bit, 32, 64, 128, and u size is also a valid data type. Now, if you're asking yourself, what is the difference? Well, let's just see for ourselves. There is a built-in min and max function to all of those. So we'll just do a handy print line and we'll call this one i8 limits. And we'll have two placeholders and we'll fill those placeholders with i8 colon colon. So we're now in the namespace of i8. And we can see there is a min and a max parameter. Let's just do min and max. And let's run our code. So you can see by usage of a twos complement, the limits of i8 are minus 128 to 127. Now we can do the same thing for an i16, for example. Just to be curious, this one is a 16-bit signed integer. And of course, this time we get much larger limits, which will be 32,000 negative and 32,000 positive. Same thing, of course, works also with the unsigned integers. You take a u8 and let's look at that. Of course, an unsigned integer would start at zero and will go up all the way to 255. I leave it as a little homework for you to play around with all the other sizes. Let us now check out how overflowing works in Rust or how the compiler prevents us from doing this. So let's say we we'll create a variable mutable a, which is an unsigned integer 8. And we'll start that off with u8 max. So this should be, as we just learned, 255. Now what will happen if we we'll add, let's say, 3 to that? Now, if you come from C or C++, what result would you get? A would be equal to 2. Would the compiler care? No. It just happens. So let's see what happens in Rust. Okay, you see we get a runtime error. And this time it says attempt to compute u8 max plus 3 unsigned h, which would overflow. So it automatically detected that adding 3 to 255 will be overflowing and we get a runtime error which is a really nice safety feature here in Rust. So therefore, let's comment this out to be able to run our code again. And we'll take a look at floating points. So there is only two floating point built-in types, which is F32 and F64. And they are exactly what you would expect. So let's say we'll create a variable, let b, and we'll have that a F32 is equal to 5.3. This would just be your typical floating point number. Now what you can do in order to check out the limits here is the exact same thing we did above. So we'll say f32 limits and we'll have the same code here. But we'll have f32 min and f32 max. And let's just run this. And we'll see those are huge numbers. And now we can check this out for F64, the 64-bit floating point number. And this will be a very huge number. Probably you need a new screen to see that. Yeah, so you see that those are huge numbers. However, with floating point numbers, you're typically more concerned with the precision rather than the minimum and the maximum number that can be stored. So we'll take a look at the number of digits that we have 
in a base 10 system. So this is going to be digits. We only need one output. Let's run this. And we'll see that a 30-bit floating point number will have around six valid digits, or accuracy of six digits when representing a floating point number. And of course, if you take the double precision value with 64 bits, you get way more precision, which is 15 digits. And there's one more thing I want to show you. Of course, there are defaults. So let's say I create a variable, let c is equal to 1. Then the Rust compiler will automatically decide this is a 32-bit integer. Now what you can see here is a type annotation that is not actually in code, but that gets displayed to me by the Rust analyzer. The same thing can be done if we have a floating point number, so d is equal to 1.1, and we will see that floating point numbers default to 64-bit. So let's now get rid of all of those unused variables, otherwise the compiler will forever scream at us. And I want to show you a bit of a nicer syntax to define some of those numbers. So let's say you have a huge number, let million is equal to a million. You could do it like this. And this would be fine. However, it's really badly readable. So what you can do, you can insert underscores in this number without the value changing. So this is still a million, but now you have an underscore in there to separate your digits. Then what you can also do is you can insert numbers in hex format. So let's say this is our hex format. And we can do just an OX, which is the typical start of a hex format. And then, for example, you can do FF. And now this is a number defined in hex. The same thing goes for a base 8 representation. So let OCT is equal to 0. And then you use a lowercase o. And for example, you can place 76 in here, and this will work. Of course, when you can do base 16 and base 8, you can also do base 2, which is binary. So let's say let bin is equal to, so you just start with 0b, and then you encode your individual bits, which might be 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And to make that a little bit more readable, we can insert our underscore between the first four and the last four bits. To make this a bit nicer. Last but not least, if you want to work with ASCII encoding, for example, you can do a binary encoded character. So let us start with saying let ASCII enc, and this only works with unsigned 8, because that's the only thing that makes sense for ASCII encoding. And we'll start with a B, and then you'll have single quotes, and in there your character that you want to encode, for example, this would give you the number. And that is already it for today. You've learned already now that we have the mutable keyword to define mutable variables. Otherwise, if we omit that keyword, we get a constant variable. We can define something like real-world constants with the const keyword, which gives us some compile time advantages. And we have all those different data types, which is signed and unsigned integers. We have floating point values of different precision. And you can have your literals for the numbers on the right-hand side of the equal sign, which some syntactic sugar, like the underscore, the hex notation, octal notation, and binary notation. Now, if you found the tutorial helpful, I would really appreciate if you liked the video and subscribe to my channel. I will see you for the next Rust topic. Stay comfy!